So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to give a talk uh, called uh, So You Want to Add a System Call. Um, talk about, uh, this is a talk that I wrote because I did a lot of work writing system calls um, and working on different ABIs and in the process learned a lot and also noticed that many of our senior develop, most senior developers in FreeBSD who add system calls did not understand how the compatibility interface worked. Um, and were really consistently wrong in all sorts of different directions. It was remarkable and surprising. Um, so I decided I'd write everything down and we'll, we'll see how, uh, how that goes. Okay, so why listen to me? Well, so I, a long time ago, I added the wiki page on how to add a system call um, in response, in, because I was trying to figure it out, I couldn't find any documentation, that was really annoying, um, and I was trying to add some system calls. Ironically, the system calls I was adding um, have never landed in the tree, um, but uh, nonetheless, I did write that page. Um, I've also implemented two complete uh, alternate ABIs outside of the FreeBSD tree, um, in CherryBSD, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, and I, uh, as a result of that work, and not wanting to type six million copies of syscalls.master, um, I automated the process of creating alternate ABI files. So, um, and I brought that into FreeBSD in the last year, uh, which should hopefully eliminate a lot of the confusion um, as now, you run some code and the code will say, you need to do this compatibility thing or you don't need to do any compatibility thing um, as long as you wrote the definition right. So why add a system call? Well, you might, obviously, you do it to access kernel resources. Um, you might do it because you need a trusted intermediary. So if you have two processes communicating and they need to do it in a way that uh, is secure, they would do it via the kernel. Um, via, rather than via some you know, shared page or something like that. Um, you might do it to avoid excess context switches. Um, for instance, uh, the send file system call was added um, so that you could say, I wanna you know, send all this data from this file out to the network and just tell me when you're done. Um, and rather than having to do reads and writes and reads and writes and reads and writes. Um, or an, in, an existing system call might be insufficiently expressive. So we've had a number of cases where we have the system call that's like almost what you want, um, so we added a new version that, has, that takes a flag. Uh, and, uh, and so those are sort of common reasons why you might want to add a system call. Next, why not? Well, the main one, system calls are mostly forever. Um, FreeBSD supports virtually every system call that any version of FreeBSD back to our origins in 4.3 uh, BSD. Um, there's a few big exceptions, like the KSE threading thing, um, which we had to remove the system calls when we ripped out all the kernel bits. Um, but for the most part, we support everything. We can run almost any binary that's ever run on a, on a FreeBSD system. And that adds maintenance burden and just an accretion of uh, attack service, frankly. Um, so, you know, don't add them for no reason. Um, it might also be that it's something like an IO control makes more sense. Um, so anything that's device or file descriptor type specific, um, that's probably uh, something for an IOctal. And I'm not gonna talk about them today, but um, they have many of the same issues that system calls do, and the design of interfaces has a lot in common. So many of the things you'll learn here would apply there. Or it might be that you want a uh, syscontrol. Um, for changing system-wide defaults or obtaining information, um, this can be good. We also tend to be a little sloppier about compatibility there um, and view them as a user space thing, so it's fine if it changes a bit. That's not totally true. Sometimes some of them are very much permanent things, um, but there's a little more flexibility. So how do system calls work? Um, we're gonna start with a really simple, but not the simplest example. We have a slightly contrived hello world here um, where we use pwriteV, which is sort of the most generic way to write a bunch of data. Um, we construct an IO vector um, array, which has uh, pointers and length, pointer length pairs, um, and then we send that out, and we call the system call implementation. So what does that system call implementation look like? Well. Here's the implementation on AMD64. Um, the parts we care about are that we set the system call number, the number of the system call we want to call, we stuff that in a register. There's this little thing that does something with ABI that I 
don't understand and didn't care about, so I didn't research it very much. Um, and then the next call tells the kernel, hey, I want to make a system call. Um, it causes a trap in the kernel, and, and that's what happened. And then on return, if there was an error flagged, then we call the C error function to handle that. Otherwise, we just return. So that's the basics of what user space does to make system calls, and we're done with user space for the day. Um, so the kernel side. Let's give a quick overview here. So there's that trap handler that I talked about when you make the system call instruction. Um, and it calls a machine-dependent um, system call handler. Um, that in turn calls uh, this syscall enter function, um, which, makes, which does a bunch of things, not all of which we're gonna talk about in any great detail, because we're interested in the interfaces um, rather than the gory details. Um, so it calls this CPU fetch syscall args um, to fill in a per thread uh, syscall arg structure, and we'll talk about more, that more. Uh, there's a bunch of tracing and auditing and checking if, it, if you're in capability mode and where, whether or not this system call is allowed to run in capability mode. Um, and then the actual implementation, which is sys underscore syscall name, um, gets called. Once that's done and it returns, um, there's this CPU set syscall retval, which adjusts the registers um, prior to return to user space to set the return value so that user space knows, is there an error flag? Um, what, was the, you know, what was returned? And then this syscall ret is called more debugging, tracing stuff that's not really to the point today. So CP, CPU fetch syscall args. Um, this is kind of where all the tricky bits come in is the interaction of this with the actual system call implementation. So this thing's job is it initializes the return value, sets a default return value, um, and then it fills in this syscall arg structure. Um, it takes that code, the number that we saw in the assembly, um, and stuffs that into this, into, into the code thing. It also fills in uh, the pointer to struct sysent that points to the actual um, details of the system call implementation, like the function pointer to the sys underscore bit, and it fills in this array of arguments. Um, so we can take up to eight arguments for each system call, and each one of them is a um, sort of machine architecture sized integer. So on 64 bit, that's a 64 bit integer. On a 32 bit machine, that would be a 32 bit integer. Now, here is the implementation of PWriteV, at least the very top of the implementation. Um, so what it does is it copies in that IO vector that we created and makes a copy of it in the kernel AVI format. Now, if that's a conventional, um, if, it's, if the kernel is using the same ABI as user space, then that's pretty much just copying it in. It just copies the array into, allocates some space and copies everything in. If that were a 32-bit uh, version, it would have to copy the elements and translate the pointers um, and translate the sizes. But uh, mostly its job here is to get that into the kernel and have it ready for use. Then we call the underlying implementation. This is the, the kern pwriteV. Most system calls have one of these, not all of them. Some of them start immediately going off and calling other system call, other kernel interfaces. Uh, but most of them these days have a kern underscore version. Um, however, we're only interested in the, inter the interface today. So we're not gonna talk about what's going on underneath, how it looks up the file descriptor and finds what type it is and figures out how to actually schlep data to it. Um, we're just gonna talk about interfaces. So I'm gonna jump to the end briefly um, and get return values out of the way. So most system calls, um, their interface is that they either return zero or negative one, zero being success, negative one being there's an error, go look at error note. Um, the C error function that I've talked about briefly is what's responsible for taking whatever the kernel user space calling convention is for passing that error back and getting it into the error note variable in user space. Um, so in this particular case, you know, so normally just the sys function will return either zero or an error code and then some magic happens so that you get what you expect in user space. So normally 
functions that set something other than zero or one um, will instead set this uh, thread-specific retval number, um, and very rarely they'll set um, a second one. The reason for the second value is that there, there are some historic system calls, um, for instance, the pipe system call, which returns two uh, file descriptors. Um, and also, that's used for, uh, that's used for 32-bit programs or 32-bit um, interfaces where you, where you need to return a 64-bit value. So it's chopped up into pieces and returned. Now, let's talk more about argument handling, because this is where all the sort of confusion and misconceptions tends to happen. So here is that system call argument structure um, that, uh, let's go back actually. Um, here's the system call argument structure, this uh, so-called UAP, um, which is argument here, and then you see these arguments are passed in as, func as pointers to function. Now, let's figure out how, how do we get, so how do we get from that array of integers that we had that we'd filled in into this structure? Well, the simple answer is we just cast it. Um, and we commit a horrible aliasing violation and hopefully it doesn't blow up in the compiler. Um, so someday it's probably gonna bite us, but for now we're okay and this is how it works. Um, so let's see how that maps in. So first off, um, we have the first element of the array and we have, the, we have our integer file descriptor. Second element of the array, we have a pointer. Third element, um, we have another integer this time an unsigned integer. And then we have an offset. Um, we're not using the offset in this case, um, but uh, here, here's the offset of zero. Well, that's all well and good, but you might notice this is all a little endian, um, where you know the actual non-zero numbers are all on the left, um, and then we have these things we don't use on the right, but what about um, a big endian system? Well, if we brought this number in as a 64-bit integer, because it was just in a register, um, we need to handle that. So in Big Andean, we add some padding. Um, put some padding in for the integers, and then we, uh, so, so everything lines up properly and we get the right values uh, in the right parts of the structure. On Little Andean, for consistency, we do the same, um, because while we don't strictly need it on any of our current 64-bit architectures, because the two 64-bit values have 64-bit alignment in the structure, it's more complete um, to pad everything out. And now, here's what it actually looks like in the kernel, so you can, you can run screaming um, and ignore this part. Um, but uh, if you ever are looking at the definition of a UAP structure um, as part of writing a system call interface, unfortunately, this is what the machine-generated code looks like, sorry. Um, there's probably some argument to be made that we could stylize the definitions so they are slightly less horrible and every line isn't 120 characters, but that uh, has not happened at this point. Uh, it actually be pretty easy uh, now that uh, Kyle has rewritten the system call generation code in Lua. Um, much easier than the pile of awk and shell we had before. So now let's talk a bit about, we, we, so you have sort of a general idea how the argument parsing works. Let's talk about adding a system call, how this works in practice. So first off, we add an entry to syscurn syscalls.master. This is where we declare um, the interface to a system call. Um, one great thing about FreeBSD, um, as opposed to Linux, is every system call has the same number on every architecture. Um, on Linux, the system call numbers start with whatever the most popular Unix platform was, uh, whatever numbers were used by the most popular Unix platform at the time that the port was created. So you might have Solaris or uh, HPUX uh, system call numbers, whereas we have them all the same. It's much nicer. Um, and we declare them all in one place. The kernel was responsible for that. There's no confusion as to whether glibc or the kernel owns things. Um, we have an integrated system, and I think that's true of all the BSDs. Um, so you add it to syscalls.master. Um, you add it to the end. Um, there are the ones in the, there are all the, all the gaps in the system call registry are now reserved for local extensions. Um, you implement um, your sysfoo function that does whatever it is you need to do. 
Um, if you need to, you implement a FreeBSD32 version of it. Um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. You run this make sysent command at the top level of the, direct, of, uh, of the source tree. Um, you export to generate some files that I'll talk about a little more. Um, you export the symbol from, you export the symbol from libc um, so that you can actually call the system call as opposed to using the, the system syscall and, uh, or the, the syscall syscall rather, um, and you add a man page, always add a man page. Um, don't make people sad. So here's what an entry looks like in syscalls.master. So on the upper left, we have, um, we have the system call number. We then have the audit event type. Allocating audit events is slightly awkward in that you need to get them allocated um, in the OpenBSM project and then get it merged back, but it's not a huge deal. Um, and there are people who monitor the mailing list there to, to get that done. Uh, this is one of the, probably the most sort of weird out of band step in the process. Um, and then we have some flags. We have, in this case, we have this STD, which means it is a standard system call. I mean, it's always part of the FreeBSD AVI, um, and it's not, say, a compatibility interface that's only on if you turn it on. Um, and then cap enable says, this doesn't access arbitrary namespaces, so it's okay to use it in, when you're using Capscom in your program and you, and you have entered capability mode. Um, we then, you know, it's the part in the middle looks just like a C function declaration, and that's by design. Um, so we have our, our types and all that stuff. It's worth noting that the tool doesn't really know what types are. It's not, it's not parsed by something that understands C. Um, and we'll get to a few extensions of this in a moment um, that, we, that we take advantage of uh, to, to work around that issue. So we add a couple more um, additions to the, to the declaration. Um, these are the first one, this in reads um, IOV count, um, tells, tells, the, so, tell, tells a programmer what the memory footprint is of this system call is. It says that from the IOV pointer, we read at most IOV count um, objects. And that's useful if you're writing um, wrappers or loggers that want to be able to deal with any system call and work fairly naively with those system calls. Um, so they don't have to know all the details of the implementation, they just need to know that, hey, I know this is gonna be read from user space. If anything outside those bounds is read, that's maybe bad. Um, and also that it's a read versus a write. And then this contains long pointer is a new addition which indicates things that there are members of the structure which might change depending on the ABI. Um, there's three sort of values for contains. There's long, so is, it, is a long 64-bit or 32-bit? Pointer, is a pointer 64-bit or 32-bit? In FreeBSD, those are always tied, but uh, in CherryBSD, that's not true. Um, so I've, I've gone ahead and generalized and put both in here. And then there's a third, which is time t, um, which basically is, are you I, is it I386 or is it a sensible architecture? Um, <laughs> and um, so, so that's, that's those indications. That, that, that's an addition, they are not strictly required, so if you're writing system calls for your own, your own platform, um, local extensions, whatnot, you don't have to do this stuff, um, but we do require those at FreeBSD, and they're very useful. So, let's talk about the user space bits. I said we were done with user space, but we weren't quite. There's a little, a little bit in the system call adding Part. So first of all, a, for a system call whose declared interface is the public interface, a stub is created automatically. There's no effort required here um, to create the stub, but you do need to expose it. Um, so you need to add it to this symbol.map file. Um, one bit that people get wrong on a regular basis is they add it to the wrong section. Um, so there is a new freebsd.1.number version for every major freebsd revision they don't have anything to do with FreeBSD versions, yay. Because um, why would we make sense? Um, uh, but uh, you need to add it to the right one, and even if you merge it back to an older version, it stays in that, that version number, uh, which is a little weird and confusing. Um, also, 
despite the fact that the majority of system calls export their underscore sys foo and underscore foo versions, that was a mistake. Um, so don't do that um, on new ones. We should probably rip them all out at some point or all the ones that aren't used by some specific library because they weren't, that wasn't intended. Um, there were some misunderstandings early in the uh, symbol versioning code or in the symbol versioning uh, uh, adoption process. So now, obviously, every new system call needs a man page. Do that. Um, and then less common, sometimes we'll add a new system call whose interface is not the public interface. So a recent example of that is the, uh, the special FD uh, system call. Um, so it's for creating, I can't even remember which type it is actually used to create for, but it would be, you would use it for something like if we were porting uh, Linux's um, event FD or timer FD, I think maybe it was added for event FD um, or signal FD. Um, if the, we have, where we have a single consolidated system call that can add, handle any of those cases, then you need to add a wrapper and you don't expose the system call itself but rather expose the wrapper. Um, not very common. The best way to handle that is find the most recent example that looks like the one you've done, the, the one you want to do, and see what was done, and uh, check for follow-up commits in case it was done wrong. Uh, <laughs> because that's, that's the, sort of the, the sort of edge cases that can get tricky. Um, you run make sysset. It generates a whole bunch of files. Um, there's this init sysset, which sets up, sets up a big array of uh, all the system calls and all the data about them, the function pointers, um, and syscalls.c, systrace, args.c is this massively horrible, ugly file um, that handles tracing, and it schleps data back and forth between the argument structure and arrays that are stored in the tracing stuff. Um, it is unfortunately large. Um, syscall.h is actually where the syscall numbers are declared. Um, sysproto.h is the internal declarations of things like the sys underscore function, the implementations, um, as well as the args structures. Um, and then syscall.make is what causes system call stubs to be generated automatically in libc. And then there's 32-bit versions of the same things. Um, the results, though, may be slightly different due to compatibility things. So let's talk about that. So when do we need to provide 32-bit compatibility? Well, an obvious case, if we have a 64-bit argument, um, on 32-bit, it doesn't fit in one register, so it had to be spread out. Um, and now we need to do some special handling there. Signed longs are a problem because longs are different sizes, so we would, if we declared it as a long in the system call argument array and didn't sign extend it, we'd have the wrong number. Um, and that would be sort of bad. Um, we're, when you have pointers to objects where the ABI differs, you need to handle that. So if you're, so like that, IO, that struct IOVEC um, that was in the, in the PWriteV uh, case, those structures differ in your, between the ABIs. So you need, to, you need to handle that at copy in. Um, and then there's the little bit that I alluded to about handling 64-bit return values. Um, this is one of these cases where maybe just don't make the public interface do that um, and do a little translation at the edge um, and maybe your life will be simpler and the code will be less weird. Um, but you don't have to handle ints, unsigned longs, or pointers because of the way we cast the data, um, because of the way we do casting um, from that Cisco LR structure. So we'll talk about that a bit more. So here we go, we've, we've converted the pwrite VRs into the 32-bit version, um, where we've, we're now pointing to IOVEC 32s, and we have split the offset into two pieces. Now, in the regular version, we had this case where we had this simple mapping um, however, in compat mode, we're mapping 64-bit, that, that array of 64-bit integers. However, we only fill the bottom of them um, uh, when, when we're uh, copying in the arguments. 
So we need to get those mapped back across. So here's the changes. So we've got, we know that we have the pointers are to a different type, and we know that the offsets, um, the offsets are split. So we need to unsplit those, those arguments. Um, and then we're gonna need to handle the IO vex. Now, turns out it's a little more complicated than that. And this is one of the things that makes everything weird. Um, and used to make system calls that master really strange. Um, is that on non 30, on 32 on bit platforms that aren't IA386, 64 bit integers are strongly aligned, and that includes in the, in the calling convention and in the registers in the calling convention. Um, so we actually have to pad to align, uh, add some padding in order to, to align the 64 bit parts, even though they're split into two pieces. Um, and that gets inserted automatically. Um, you don't have to think about it anymore, thankfully. Um, it did turn out, though, as I was in the process of automating the, the uh, handling of FreeBSD 32 calls, I found that there were two system calls that, in fact, were broken and never had worked. Um, fortunately, it probably what probably what happened in practice is that it was the case. Um, I think it was pReadv and pwritev. Um, the last argument probably was always zero because no one ever uses the offset. Um, or if they did, they didn't notice because they were using small enough files. Um, and it worked kind of by accident. So yeah, um, this is why automation is good. Computers are better at remembering all these stupid little details. I, will, I, have, I had even forgotten some of these details when I went to review my slides. So thankfully, we have computers. Um, and then here, let's look at the quick, quickly at the implementation of the 32-bit pwriteV. Um, the two things that differ, we have this copy in UIO, except it's a 32-bit version. So it allocates space for the, for the vector, it copies in the one from user space, and then it updates it so that we have 64-bit pointers and 64-bit size Ts. That's all it does. Um, and then we have this handy little pair macro which knows that there's two members in the structure which are offset one and offset two, I think. Um, yes, offset one and offset two, and it knows to glue them together. It does the right thing for whatever your endianness is, and it all just works. Um, so that's kind of all you have to do in a simple case like this. Um, and if you design your interface right, you won't have to do any more than this. Um, if you design your interface badly, life could get complicated. So when your 32-bit compat function starts to get horrible, it's time to rethink your interface. So, a little guidance on new system call APIs. So, first of all, as I mentioned, signed longs are kind of weird, so maybe avoid them. Um, unsigned longs are fine, if, and, and unsigned longs appear in the form of size Ts on a regular basis. Um, that's all sensible and fine, but unsigned longs get weird, so maybe don't use them, maybe use a fixed 64-bit type. Um, for object ABIs, um, so try to make things that don't contain pointers have the same ABI. So, you know, use fixed width types um, where possible and, and appropriate. And if you do need to store a pointer, make sure to use a pointer, an actual one, or a uint pointer T. Don't use a long, don't do what Linux does and use U64 everywhere. Um, you know, you use the right type because in the future, pointers won't be integers. Um, if you do need to store an address, um, I suggest using KV at RT. Um, it's kind of oddly named, but the, the goal is basically if you need to share it, if you need to share something that is definitely an address and not a pointer, for instance, you want to share, you're using the address of an object in the kernel as a token. Um, that you don't have to trust, but you're using it um, for, for convenience or just as a unique value, KV at RT is your friend. Um, if you are adding explicit padding, consider the possibility that pointers might be bigger than 64 bits someday. Um, because otherwise, if you, you might save yourself trouble now, but in, hope, in, in hopefully just a few years, pointers might be bigger. Um, Overall, try to ensure that the memory footprint can be described with the SAL annotations I talked very briefly about. Um, they're documented at the top of syscalls.master as well. Um, this is hand, handy for people writing tracing tools, 
um, and writing sanitizers and things like that. So it's not always possible, but do try. Um, don't write new system calls that take a variable number of arguments. Um, they work today because every ABI we use, except maybe power, um, just assumes that if you're passing up to however many registers you're allowed to use for, for passing arguments, that the calling convention is the same between variadic and non-variadic functions. So the values, the value, the optional value of open that everyone forgets to add um, and uses garbage instead of as a permission, um, that value is just passed because it's always, you know, they just look in a register. So try not to do that anymore. And if you're adding your system well and it doesn't have a flags field, maybe think about adding one even if it's gratuitous and you have to write a wrapper to hide it um, because it means you, get, you have an extension mechanism later. So a little bit of bonus content on FreeBSD 64 and how that works in Cherry. So we don't have time for a full introduction to Cherry. Um, it's easy to give a two-hour talk on Cherry. I'm gonna give you the like two-minute talk. Um, so the short, short version is that Cherry introduces a new hardware type called the capability. Capabilities grant access to regions of memory. Their validity is maintained in both memory and in registers through a tag value. So if you store arbitrary data in a register or in memory that was a capability, you, the tag is cleared in the process and you can't use it as a pointer anymore. Um, so you can only use guarded manipulation um, to, to, to change the values. That means you can't take the pointer that points to some object and make it point to some other object. Um, that's just simply not allowed by the architecture. Um, capabilities can only be derived from other capabilities and, only do, and it can only be done in a way that reduces their permissions or maintains them. Um, so you can think of them as 128-bit unforgeable fat pointers. Um, so they are bounded and they're bounded and you can't just make them up. And in a Cherry system, all memory access is via a capability one way or another. Either it's via an explicit capability load or it's via a default capability using a conventional load instruction or store instruction or jump. Um, but that, can, that capability can also be restricted. And in fact, in our Cherry ABI, um, ABI that capability is null and has has uh, access to nothing. So you can only make explicit accesses. So this leads to some ABI differences. Um, first, there's some ABI similarities. In Cherry ABI, um, it is a 64-bit ABI, so longs, time t's, and um, are, are the same, and also 64-bit objects are aligned, or 60, yeah, 64-bit types are strongly aligned, just like normal. However, pointer size, um, is now 128 bits, and pointers are aligned to 128 bits. Um, also, pointer providence is strict, which is this property that means you can only create a pointer from another pointer. Um, you can't just, you know, write down, I want a bunch of, you know, write a bunch of Fs down and say, I want access to some kernel memory. Um, you, have to, you have to have derived that from somewhere else. So, on CherryBSD, um, our default ABI these days is Cherry ABI, where every pointer is a capability. But that's not a viable transition path. Cherry C is not quite the C language. Um, it's very, very close, um, but not quite. Um, so we need to be able to run hybrid code. And it, it's a big part of our compatibility story is that you can take a Cherry processor and you can run your existing, your existing code on it and you get no benefit, but you also don't have any cost. Um, so you can deploy Cherry hardware and the risks are quite minimal. Um, and as you start adopting, you get more and more benefit. So we added this 32, FreeBSD 32 compat layer. Um, however, one thing that's important about the compat layer is once you're in the kernel, we've made it so that all access to the to user space is via a capability. Um, so we actually have to derive capabilities um, from system call arguments and from inside structures um, in order to access user space. Now we do that just using the default capability for that process or thread, um, but it is something that has to be done. 
Um, otherwise, it's a lot like FreeBSD32, except that we don't have to handle time T, because we always have 64-bit time Ts. We don't have to handle longs um, and size Ts. So constructing user space capabilities. How does this work? Well, we have a bunch of macros that help out. Um, there's a little bit of ugliness here, because it turns out that we have a bunch of weird POSIX ABIs where there are magic sentinel values passed as pointers. Um, so for instance, map failed return from mmap is passed as a void star, but it's minus one. Um, and likewise, the one that comes from user space is things like sig, sig IGN, um, ignore a signal, um, <clears throat> or sig default is the other one. Um, and these are just small numbers passed as pointers. So we don't want to create a pointer to that, because it's not a valid pointer. Um, so what we do instead is we have this little bit of a hack, where basically anything in the bottom page, which you're not allowed to map because that's bad. Um, we had a nasty bug around that once. Um, and also, anything above the valid user address space, we create null capabilities or null derived capabilities which don't have actually access to anything. Um, that works pretty well. We have a couple of macros here, one of which is a, sets bounds on an object, so when we know what the size of something is, we can set bounds on it, and then if there's a kernel implementation bug elsewhere, um, we will get a fault in copy in or copy out. Uh, sometimes we don't, know what the, we don't know what the bounds should be, so we have this other macro um, that just doesn't set any bounds, and that works just like, 30, like a conventional ABI does today. Um, it's no worse than it was before. Um, and then we have a bunch of other helper macros, but I didn't want to bore you with another slide full of them. Um, but uh, this is basically how it works. And, it does, and we actually have found some cases where those bounds would mitigate things we issued security advisories for. Um, so that is a case where your completely unmodified code gets some security benefit at a system level um, from running on a cherry system. So, quick look at what the FreeBSD 64 p write v uh, implementation looks like. Um, but it turned out I had four copies of this thing with the copy and UIO thing. So I created a user p write v, um, yet one more layer of abstraction like any proper computer scientist, um, which meant that I had to write a tiny bit less code. So now we, we uh, here, we uh, construct an argument to the, uh, or a capability to the array of IOVEX, and then we pass in a copy in UIO vec structure, and here's the actual thing. So we call the function pointer, um, and then we call the implementation. It, this looks like the old sys version, it's now, except now the, the uh, per, per ABI versions are a tiny bit smaller. Whether it's worth doing, eh. In this case, probably pretty mixed, but um, at one point in, FreeBSD, in Cherry BSD, we had two additional compatibility ABIs plus the system one, and I was just like, I don't want any more duplicate code than, than necessary. So I started refactoring. So a few final comments. Adding a system call is relatively straightforward. I mean, other than the dirty bits down at the bottom that it, you know, actually do the work. Um, but you should ask yourself, should you? And, you know, should I do this? Or, and also, is the interface the right one? Um, so seek review early and often, um, and let us help refine the process. Um, we've got a number of people who are experts on how to do these sort of interfaces, um, but you know, seek help if it's something you want. If it's something you feel like needs to be done, you know, get advice. So happy to take questions. Yeah, I will. Yes. So what is the status of CherryBSD and Morello? So, um, I mean, it is experimental in the sense that, you know, Morello is a prototype. It's a 100 million pound prototype. Um, but it is, a, it is nonetheless a prototype, and the architecture exactly as it is is not what would become a product. There will be changes. Um, however, it is very much real. CherryBSD runs on it. We have been running on Morello hardware since, what? November, December last year. Um, our next release uh, in probably October is going to have packages um, 
that work with the GPU that's on the SOC, um, and we should have a have Wayl a Wayland-based graphic GUI environment with uh, KDE um, and you know basic stuff up and running, and at least be able to run legacy you know a legacy Firefox. We got uh, Morello. Uh, so Morello is a is a proving ground. Uh, Morello is to Morello exists to sort of to deal with the fact that um, hardware people don't want to spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and money implementing something the software people won't use, and software people don't want to spend, and it's really imp don't want to spend huge amounts of time and energy building software for hardware that doesn't exist. Um, and Morello is designed is intended to get us to the point where we can all say, yes, this is. This technology is what we need. It is worth the cost. Um, the benefits the benefits are worth it, and we will make this massive change. Um, and it's very promising, both in terms of being able to use legacy um, legacy C and C plus plus, which um, to replace with a safe language like Rust, cost estimates are insane. Um, tens or hundreds of billions of dollars to rewrite all the open source code, um, whereas porting to Cherry. Um, considerably less than that. Um, not free, but considerably less than that. Um, also, we're seeing, for instance, uh, a early prototype of Rust on Cherry. We can eliminate many of the checks. We might be able to make Rust as fast as C um, with the help of Cherry and really close that gap. So now we can have a better, faster programming, a better programming environment that's also as fast. So when, when replacement makes sense, things are also better. So the, the question is, is there, is there a formal system, review process for system calls, particularly because if you introduce a new system call that does horrible things and is insecure, um, it's hard to fix that. Um, there is not really a formal process per se. Um, I don't, yeah, there's not really a formal process. I mean, there are a few people who are, you know, flagged on reviews. I'm always flagged on any review that touches syscalls.master, so I see them all. Um, and I make sure to tag people who I think should be involved. Um, there's always some risk there. We don't, I don't know that we have a, we don't have a really, yeah, I'm not sure what that process would look like if we had one. Yes? So questions about dynamic system calls. So where a module provides them. So generally speaking, in FreeBSD, um, we, dec we actually add an entry in the system call table um, in syscalls.master for any system call that's, even system calls that are loaded by modules, it is possible to load them otherwise. Um, I guess the rules about compatibility are kind of the same. Um, my personal preference is that if it's in the base, it should be in syscalls.master even if it is always provided by a module. Um, the one exception in the current case is, is it PM, I don't remember, it's PMC something, it's the, there is no reason for it to be that way, and that should be fixed. Um, it just serves no purpose, um, and is kind of bad from a tracing perspective, um, and it's problematic on Cherry. Um, it is possible to add loadable system calls that have not been declared, but it's more complicated. And if they're if they're particularly weird and require special argument handling, it just won't work. Yes. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, the comment was that 
yeah, I suggested IR, IR control, but IR control is kind of kludgy. And um, so IR control, I think, makes sense if it is specific to a particular file descriptor or a particular device and, and really narrow. Um, I agree, it is a kludgy mess, I hate it. Um, the interface is, everything is wrong. Um, I want to fix it, uh, but no one, will, no one will pay me to fix it. Um, there's a, so yeah, it, it, I mean, I think system calls are generally cleaner. Um, it's very clear what you want to do, but, but you know, they are very heavyweight in terms of like their, just the accreted cost of maintaining this system. So caution is required. I don't know that I have a great answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like we're maybe a little too conservative in adding system calls. You know, you mentioned um, the cost of maintaining it in Libc. If the interface is the public one, then there's no, I mean, yes, the headers get a tiny bit bigger, but that's kind of like it. You know, Libc grows a five instruction sequence. Um, it's not, not that big a deal. Like, we shouldn't just like spray them everywhere and add a dozen a year, but, uh, um, but I don't think we should be overly conservative. And I really, I've had a lot of problems implementing muxed system calls, like, um, uh, what is it, uh, UMTX op, um, which is used for mutexes. It's just, it's confusing and complicated, and my life would be simpler if it was a bunch of separate system calls, because it's just easier to understand what's going on. Um, you don't have argument type confusion, where some things are, where one, one mux thing takes a pointer and one takes an integer. Um, in all current Cherry architectures, that's fine. In our MIPS implementation that we've deleted, um, we had a separate register file, so you had to like figure out where to go grab the value from. It was awful. Uh, <laughs> Mark. Yeah, so Mark asks about whether we could add some introspection to IO control um, so we could know what types a device uses. Um, yeah, it's not something I really thought much about. Um, one of the, the things I have thought about with IO control is one of the ways we differ from Linux, um, and I think everyone else actually, is that we, we do the copy in of the data, the object, um, from user space in a central location. And that's nice in a lot of ways. It's simplifying, it's great, but it's horrible for compatibility. Um, you'd like to be able to make the transform, it's, it would be more convenient to make the transform at the lower level um, in some cases. And there are some tricks that like um, Conrad did with, in, in his, uh, I guess, master's thesis um, where he wrote he generated custom copy-ins to do translation, and that only works if you do it where you know what the type is. And with IO control, you only know what the type is when you get all the way to the device and the actual implementation. And it's, so it's an awkward mismatch. Um, I think some things would be simpler if we could, if we would defer, but I can't imagine us doing the work uh, without also like revving the whole darn interface. Um, I just. Because you'd, you'd have to go and change every implementation. It'd be awful. Um, it, there is a bit pattern in the ioctal command. There are three bits that set in a particular way are always invalid. So we could do that and have 29 bits that are still usable um, <laughs> uh, that we could reuse and do a whole new implementation on top of it. But that seems kind of awkward. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, so Hans points out that in Linux IO controls, while there is an in and an out, there's no actual, because the copies are decentralized, there's no checking. Um, it's actually something we might be able to address with Cherry. Um, we could make those pointers write read only or write only. Um, as we pass them down, that could be entertaining. Um, there'd be lots of explosions, but they'd be good, they'd be good explosions. Anyone else, or shall, I, shall we flee to lunch? All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>